everyone. We paid 7.2.5. We got the long awaited Chromie scenario, which I've gone out of my way to avoid spoilers for. I've seen a lot of people hype this up while testing it on the PTR, and after finishing it myself, I'm very happy that the hype was not without reason. I really, really like what they've done with this one, so if you haven't done this scenario yet and you still want to do it, be warned, spoilers ahead. If you don't want any spoilers, then please turn off the video right now. For those that are sticking around, it's Katgar who has a quest for us, since there's news from the dragons in Northrend. Chromie, the bronze ambassador to Wormrest Temple, is convinced that something unusual has happened in the timelines. The Archmage would help her himself, but he is a paralyzing fear of paradoxes, so instead we're sent out to check in with the dragon. Now a little background information on the bronze dragonflight, it might be handy to understand the situation just a little bit better. Way back when, when the Titan Keepers decided to call upon the powers of the Titans to empower five special proto-dragons into the dragon aspects, it was Nosdormu who was chosen to become the aspect of time. Unto you is charged the great task of keeping the purity of time. Know that there is only one true timeline, though there are those who would have it otherwise. You must protect it. Without the truth of time as it is meant to unfold, more will be lost than you can possibly imagine. The fabric of reality will unravel. It is a heavy task, the base of all tasks of this world, for nothing can transpire without time. They also showed him the moment of his demise to know that despite his incredible powers over the ebb and flow of time, none are above the ultimate fate. There's also not just one Nosdormu out there, there's an endless amount of them in the past, in the present and in the future. Multiple timeways, multiple realities, multiple moments and at least one of those timelines, Nosdormu was tricked by the old gods into actually abusing his powers. They tricked him in trying to subvert his mortality, the one thing that he was not meant to do, he actually did it and as a result, he shattered the time waves and he created the infinite dragon flights. This flight is led by the corrupted Nostormu, now known as Moruzant, and their motives they've not been fully explained yet, but they do seem to be very interested in messing up the timelines. They directly try to stop Medi from opening up the dark portal, they try to stop Arthas from going to Northrend, and they try to stop Thrall from escaping Durnhold. So that's how the bronze dragon flight works, they work very hard on keeping the timeline pure and as it should be, and they're not stuck in one single moment. We now have Chromie, who was reviewing some aberrations in the timeways when she discovered something unexpected, something not so great. She's going to die in the near future. Bad times, man. She was just about to jump ahead and see if she could figure out why, how and who, but she'd feel a lot better with us at her side, so we join her to the future. Hold on to your helmet. We're traveling through time. <laughs> Alright, let's see here. I think we're at the right time, give or take a minute. Am I dead yet? Oh, good. There I am over there. Hi, me. Oh, hi. What are you doing here? Welp. That didn't exactly go so great, but now we do know when the attack happens and vaguely where it's coming from. That's progress, all we need to do now is find out more details and stop this attack. This time we go to the future with a smidge more time before the murder. Here we go! Again! We have a chat with the four Dragonflight ambassadors, starting with Chromie herself to ask if she's seen anything strange lately. Strange? Let me think. Oh, I did see that black dragon earlier today. Uh, what was his name? Deathwing? No, 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 not him. The other one. Um, the one with a hat. Pretty sure he was headed to the Obsidian Dragon Shrine. We'll check it out. Thanks! Alexstrasza, she's seen the dead walk once more, and while the Ruby Dragon Shrine has a history of conflict with the undeads, most of their struggles subsided with the fall of the Lich King. Lately, such incidents have been on the rise again, and since we're here in the future, the question is, is the Lich King that she's talking about, is it Arthas or is it Bolvar? Undead attacks at the Ruby Dragon Shrine? We'll take a look. Thanks, Allie. Lord Ivarius of the Green Dragon of Light, he's been informed about the struggles of their Garden Keeper at the Emerald Dragon Shrine. She's been struggling to keep the Dreamers asleep, and several of the Ancients they've unexpectedly awakened from the dream. Thank Be you, careful. Lord Ivarius. We'll take a look, and we'll let you know if we find anything. Then, our final ambassador, Caligos of the Blue Dragon Flight, who's not seen anything particularly strange, besides the ley lines that have been acting up again, but that's pretty normal in this part of the world. Leyline disturbances? Psh, typical blue dragon problems. Sounds like we've got some dragon shrines to investigate. 
Let's go, uh, investigate some dragon shrines. That sounded way better in my head than it did out loud. We got some leads to investigate now, and unfortunately for whomever is fixated on blasting her into oblivion, she's a fairly skilled master of the time ways. We can try this over and over and over again until she's not dead anymore. Now you might wonder, why is Chromie allowed to change her death when someone like Nosdormu becomes corrupted? But they actually explain this in a quest later on, that she has seen the moment of her demise. She knows exactly when she's supposed to die, and this is not that moment. It happens much later than this. That makes it okay to fix the situation. But then there's also the question, why is she still so powerful? At the end of the Cataclysm, the Aspects apparently fulfilled their destiny by defeating Deathwing and stopping the Hour of Twilight. This meant that they lost their immortality, they lost their ability to have babies, and they lost a huge portion of their power. Not all of it, but enough for the dragons to now need the aid of the mortals. And in the case of the Bronze Dragons, they've actually formed the organization called the Time Walkers. We partied with them during Mr. Pandaria on the Timeless Isle. We helped Kairos Dormu with creating and filling up the Vision of Time. This gave them enough power to see visions of the past, present, and the possible futures. Visions also used during Garrus' trial. But Raphion and Kairos, they had more minds. The Bronze used the Hourglass to send him and Garrosh. They went back in time to an alternate reality, with the plan to form the Iron Horde to have that Horde help us with fighting the inevitable Legion attack. Unfortunately, Garrosh didn't feel like being controlled like that. He had his own plans in mind and he murdered the dragon as soon as they arrived. So then the question is, why can Chromie now manipulate time like this when in the past they needed a whole lot of help to do so? I have no idea, but it does give us the chance to go back to the future, this time with a little bit more time on our hands so we can actually do something about our death. Alright, I'm chronoporting us to a point four hours before the attack happens. That'll give us plenty of time to untangle this mess. Huh, that's weird. Something's blocking me from accessing that particular moment. No worries. Four hours was probably too early anyways. Let's try one hour. Now I'm starting to get worried. Whoever orchestrated this attack really did their homework. They found a way to block my chrono ports. Let's give this one last try. Freeze! There, that did it. We are now at a time 15 minutes before my death. That probably won't be enough time to save me, but it's the best I can do for now. She's able to slow time significantly, which gives us the chance to discuss our strategy and pick Chromie's abilities. These unlock as our reputation with her increases, her power and familiarity with the timeline, and our first choice is between her freezing enemies or increasing our movement speed, while also increasing damage and healing done. The second tier has health increased, with the choice between Chromie becoming a tank or becoming a healer. Third tier has movement and mountain speed increased, with the choice between reducing damage taken by Chromie or increasing our reputation gained. Next option is damage and healing increased, with Chromie either revealing nearby treasure chests or a greater chance to earn a bronze drake from the sands of time. Fifth tier has no choice, it's a 10% health increase and a bigger chance to find these sands of time. Tier number six has a movement and mountain speed increase again, while also giving the choice between either portals from worm rest to the dragon shrines or a greater chance to earn a keepsake box from the sands of time. And then the final tier, again no choice, it's damage, healing, health, movement and mountain speed increase. And on top of that, Chromie can summon a dragon that crashes into our enemies. The first two tiers they unlock without delay, while the rest of them are time gated. Yes, not even a bronze dragon is immune for the time gating, yet at the same time I can appreciate it here, since you can finish the scenario without all these buffs, but those that do it on their alt or are lesser geared, they will eventually unlock all of these buffs and they too will be able to finish this scenario. Let's go! So here we are, we have 15 minutes and 4 dragon shrines to investigate to find out where these attacks are coming from. And first up is the Emerald Dragon Shrine. Nishera, the Garda Keeper, she's still keeping an eye on the place and she lets us know that the dreamers have been restless. It's been quite overwhelming. We can help with that. Path. 
Barkyhorn, Elder Aldera and Bloombeard, they are the dreamers that are now suffering an inescapable nightmare. Through their torments, they mumble about the enemy being in the dream. Stop this torment, please help me! The attacks are coming from the dream, so we have to find a way to get into the Green Dragon's realm by killing the Emerald Sky Talents and the Emerald Lashers, who in turn drop Emerald Dean Plume and Twisted Fibers. Combining these creates a Nightmare Catcher, which lets us enter the Emerald Nightmare. Now it's interesting that the Emerald Nightmare is still a thing. Now of course this is the future, and apparently not the future as it's meant to be since Chromie dies here, but in a quest later given by Lord Ifarius, he does mention that Ysera is gone. That lines up with what happened in our timeline, in which we were forced to take it out because she was corrupted by Xavius the Nightmare Lords, and yet the Nightmare is not completely gone. Not entirely surprising, but still cool to see. So we go into the Nightmare to take care of these Dream Tormentors, and we save the Dreamers, who tell us that we must stop the Great Nightmare, seek our answers by the water, our attacker lies within the Dragon's Palm. The Dreamers gave us three clues. Great Nightmare, by the water, Dragon's Palm. Uh, we just need to figure out what they mean. Let's go! This has to be the spot, and I did try to check out this area before, but you have to save the dreamers before Chromie can reveal the enemy, namely the Seder Talus Valforn. Your time twisting days are at an end, whelp! The Seder proclaims as he hurls nightmare bolts, which really, really hurts. He tries to put us asleep and he caused the dark eruption, but he is stunnable and interruptible. Odd, I don't remember getting on the Seder's bad side, either now or in the future. Look at this! A chrono shard. We should bring it back with us to worm rest. On his dead body, we find a gleaming chrono shard, which glitters with a metallic sheen. We can use this to connect to another time and place, so we hand it over to Chromie, who creates a whole new time portal. Interesting. A portal to Anderhal. <laughs> That's one of my favorite places of any when. Let's see if I'm in trouble. I have a sneaking suspicion that the enemy is planning a cross-synchronous attack. Why else would they be using chrono shards, right? I can tell you're a little foggy on what that means. Basically, they're attacking me at multiple points in time simultaneously. These guys really know what they're doing. I wouldn't be surprised if they had a bronze dragon on their side. Anderhal, a few months after the Cataclysm, we're in the middle of a battle between the Horde and the Alliance. There it is. You have your orders. Slay the dragon. See? This is one of the problems with being a gnome. Sometimes Horde soldiers just get the urge to kick you. Sheesh. Soldiers of the Alliance, hold your ground. She can't hide forever. The Alliance wants me too? What's going on right now? Inside, we find Adrien Tohide of the Sonarian Circle, which you might remember from the Zenkiki questline, and she's taking care of the wounded from both the Alliance and the Hordes. This is where we found Chromie in the game for the very first time, all the way back in Classic, where she assisted us with helping out Pamela Repoff and the battle for Derrishire, while in return we helped her with fixing some time tempering. She was moved with the Cataclysm revamp, but a version of her got stuck here in the middle of the battle for Anderhal, and we need to help her out. I can hold my own here. But I can't fly away with that cannon pointed at the skies. Both factions, for some reason, they have their eyes on the bronze dragon, and we need to take care of this siege cannon. But that's not as easy as it sounds, since it comes with an electroconnected defense grid, which means that it's nearly impossible to hit, while also having some heavy iron plating, which reduces its damage taken to nearly nothing. We need something special to bring it down. Items collected from the soldiers of either the Alliance or the Horde, depending of course on what faction you play for, until we have an experimental alchemy reagent dropped from the Apothecary Rare, and this will melt the iron plating of the siege cannon. The lightning absorption capsule that will drop from the engineering rare and this will remove the lightning shield while I also got some military explosives which will deal 15% of the siege cannon's total health in damage. Now don't be like me and only melt the iron plating and immediately use the explosives since the chance to hit it also applies to your items. After taking out the cannon the chromie of this moment can make an escape while you can also loot circle documents from a time loss keepsake which you need to deliver to Adrian Tohide. Interesting. These documents mark the bearer as some sort of higher up in the Sonarian circle. 
Maybe we can use them to grease some wheels in Anderhal. The documents say that we come bearing orders from Keeper Remulus himself. We tell her that the druids, they need to distract the cannons outside so that our bronze dragon friends can escape. This will instantly complete saving her from this attack and it will allow you to skip the need of destroying the cannons. The cannon is down! Can you make it out? <sighs> I think so. See you next time! Time's up, and it might seem impossible to save Chromie from all these attacks in such a short time. But thankfully, the things that we discover, the enemies behind the attacks at the Dragon Shrines, our Chromie will remember and is able to reveal them immediately when we get back. Let's not ask ourselves why the Chromie of the future does not have this knowledge. Like Nosdormu once said, Time is a tangled web. Try not to dwell on all the loose ends. Here we go. Again. This time, we travel to the Azure Dragon Shrine, where Sidagos is keeping an eye on the place. He tells us that the Ley Lines, they've always been fuzzy in this part of the world, but today, they are acting particularly strange. It seems like there's something interfering with them. Good luck, Let's friend. get down there and look for clues. Maybe the disturbances are coming from whoever wants to kill me. In the shrine, we have leyline elementals and layworms floating about. They drop darkened scrap of vellum, which we combine to create a void color scroll. The scroll pieces combine to form a tethered but readable message. The time is nigh. The invocation will take place above the Azure Shrine. The void will swallow the bronze dragon. Our master has spoken, and we obey. Above the Azure Shrine is where our target hides out. Chromie reveals the Void Gargantuan, who's actually surprised to, what I assume to be her, Chromie, actually surprised to see her here. It causes Void Blast and also has Looming Shadows, which creates a field on the ground which silences you and deals damage if you stand in it, but he is stunnable and very manageable. I never expected to be on the bad side of a And looky here! It was carrying a Chrono Shard! I need to bring this to Wormrest to find out where it goes. Like before, we bring the smoldering Chrono Shard, still hot to the touch, back to the Wormrest Temple, where Chromie creates a new time portal. Uh ha! -huh. A portal to Mount Hygel! I've been there a time or tree. Uh, three. Uh, I meant to say three. Let's see... We're in Mount Hygel? Ah! Uh, shortly after the time of the Cataclysm. I remember this! I should be just up ahead. There I am! Worry, we'll protect you. Stop right there! The Chromie of this time period, the one who showed up during the Protectors of Hydro quest to defend Sephria's Roost, she's in a bit of a pickle as waves of fiery minions are coming for her. We protect her from a Searing Overlord with a bunch of Flamehounds, a Searing Overlord receiving Pyre Lords, a Fire Lord that spawns little lava spawns and patches of fire on the floor, blazing phoenixes that try to strike her down from above, until finally the fiery behemoth makes an appearance. He hits like an absolute truck, he spouts lava under our feet and he calls Fire Nova, which you really need to interrupt her stun because again the giant really hurts. You could also loot a brimstone beacon from a time lost keepsake box which will instantly summon the behemoth allowing you to skip all these waves of trash. A brimstone beacon? Fascinating! I think we can use this to rile up the fire elementals in Mount Hygel. Sorry. Feeling better? I'll be fine I think. <laughs> Thanks for the help. Another death prevented, as the Chromie of this time hearthstones out and our time is up. Maybe next time. Here we go! Again! It was around this time that I was actually starting to get quests from the emissaries, which has you kill the end boss at the shrine and they will reward you with a couple of cents of time. This time we're going to investigate what's going on at the Ruby Dragon Shrine and we have a talk with Sanctum Guardian Zerestraza. You might remember saving her during the Ruby Sanctum raid and she lets us know that they usually only have to deal with like one or two stray ghouls that trickle in each day. But today they've actually attacked in numbers that they haven't seen in nearly 10 years. Good luck. Come on you! Let's go clear out the undead leaders. Maybe they'll know something about the upcoming attack. Sadly, the timeline that we have to work with, the one from the Ultimate Visual Guide, it doesn't go beyond the invasion of Pandaria, which is set at year 30. Raw the Lich King is set at year 27, so if she's talking about those attacks, that would mean that this moment in time, it is set around year 37. Each expansion usually lasts a year or two on the timeline, so that would be year 32 for Warlords, 34 for Legion, 36 or 37 for the next expansion, in which we apparently only gain two levels, but our item level is a whopping 1000. Neat. Always nice to know the future. 
Anyways, we go around the Ruby Dragon Shrine, taking on the leaders of the undead. We have Earliest the Death Rider, who stands with the Ancient Warriors, Alindriel Graveborn, who stands with Forgotten Wailers, and Vestablood, who has a whole bunch of bloodless ghouls to fight with him. Each of them drop a Soul Crystal Fragment, which combines into a Soul Crystal. Once reassembled, the image of a powerful Lich, it appears above the crystal surface. Keep the Ruby Shrine Wardens occupied! I shall carry out our master's attack from within the Great Tree itself! A lich! Ugh, I figured as much. Though it's odd I couldn't see it in any future timeline. He's inside the tree, right? Let's go get him then. His time has come! Inside the tree, Gromir reveals Talar Icechill, who believes that the fingers of death coil around her scaly neck. He will cause Frostbolt, he has ice armor, and he puts Chromie into an ice block with the priest, but we can easily get her out again, and we take care of the Lich. That's one threat taken care huh? of! Huh? What's this? Some kind of Chrono Shard? I'll have to bring it back to Wormrest to investigate. Another Chrono Shard, this time a frozen one, which still has the distinctive Lich smell to it. I see... a portal to Stratholm! Back in the days of the Third War. Stratholm! During the Third War. Ooh, I remember this day. Not exactly Prince Arthas's finest moment. Chromie! Thank the sands you've arrived! They've taken you into the city! I guess we're headed into Stratholm. Let's get a move on. We don't have much time. We're here just before Arthas decided to purge the city, and we've been here before with Chromie to make sure that Arthas actually battled with Morganus and made his way to Northrend. Back then, it was the Infinite Dragonflight who tried to stop him, but they are nowhere to be seen in this timeline. Instead, Tick lets us know that Chromie, who was supposed to be here, she's been taken into the city, so we need to save her. But the only problem is, is that the town is on lockdown, and we can't get to her without the town hall door key. It's barkeep Emily Nail who has the key, and although he wants to help us out since we have an honest look about us, nothing in this world comes for free. He has us pick up some salted venison jerky from George Goodman, some fresh special pipe blend from Fresh Yabi, which you might remember fighting his undead version in Strathholm, and he has us pick up a marigold bouquet from Sophie Aaron. The smoke and the meat, they are for him, but the flowers, they are for the kids at the orphanage down the street. And when he means the kids, he's actually talking about orphan matron Miliana, who the barkeep has a thing for. She blushes and admires the dummy's persistence, but she has little time to enjoy the flowers, as Prince Arthas is ready to go. I can only help you with a clean death. That was just the beginning. This city will be cleansed. Prince Arthas has begun his purge, and throughout the city, we can see that the infected grain, it has already been distributed. Stephanie Sindri is actually quite impressed with how much grain the farmers have been able to gather. Something does smell off about it though, but the citizens, they don't really see a problem. Not yet anyways. It's only Pepper the Horse who knows that something's not quite right. Well, Meliana, she is dumbstruck by her prince, just striking out people in the middle of the street in pure cold blood. She needs to protect the children, so she needs us to pick up a rifle from Robert Pierce, some basic cloth bandages from Olivia Zenev, and another piece of salted jerky from George Goodman. They do have enough food, but she wants us to deliver it to the dummy in the tavern, letting him know that it's from the kids. No purge will stop the flirting between these two characters, and Emery can hardly conceal his smile. One last request from him, before handing over the key, he doesn't want to go down without a fight. He is going to set this whole damn tavern on fire, if you bring him the tools to do it safely, namely a flinty fire starter from Fresh Yabi, and some heavy strong rope from George Goodman. Nobody, no mad prince or drooling zombie, nobody's going to take his bar away from him without a fight. He does hand over the key, so best of luck barkeep, as Strathholm finally falls to the plague and his turns. Now we're not here to help Arthas with his cleanse, we're here to save Chromie, so we use the key, we get into the town hall, we slay the zombies in their path, until we reach the hidden entrance, which was normally owned by Arthas, but thankfully Chromie remembers. Follow me, we don't have much time! The gauntlet is just like before. We have to fight our way through the burning city while taking on bow golems, dark necromancers, enraged ghouls, and a whole bunch of zombies. At the end, where Arthas is supposed to fight Malganus, we now find Crypt Deceivers and Nezar Azret, the one who is taking Chromie of this time. Yikes! That's one nasty looking creature. Well, there's no getting past her. Looks like we're gonna have to take her on! 
The creature, it doesn't really do much. I think it tried to use Tangled Web, but it was easy enough to kill. Now, the way that you could cut some time in this timeline, that is by buying the items in one single go, rather than picking it up and turning in the quest one by one. I did notice that the vendors don't immediately offer all the items that you need. They only become available if you've done the quest before, so there's no way that you could do it faster on your first run. Alternatively, you could also loot the Strathholm Gate Key from a time lost keepsake box. Is that a Strathholm Gate Key? This must be our lucky day! Keep that handy for the next time we visit Stratholm. This key allows you to skip the entire fetch quest and the gauntlet, since you can open up the gate on the left, which does have a bunch of Crypt Deceiver standing behind it. But of course, it is a whole lot faster than having to pick up all these items and go through the gauntlet. After taking down Nezra Azret, we're able to set this Chromie free from her webbing. Thank you so much for saving me! Any time! Here we go! Again! One more shrine to investigate, the obsidian one, where an old familiar face is hanging out, none other than Refion. I know this shrine has been abandoned for a few years now, but really? Shambling skeletal remains? Father would never have approved of this. We're trying to find out who's about to attack Chromie. We thought you might know something. Me? Why does everyone always suspect the black dragon? I'm ashamed, Kronormu. No, I know nothing about an attack. I was simply visiting Norfriend for... My own amusement, let's say. I was, however, surprised to see the skeletal infestation here in our beloved dragon shrine. If you're looking for someone who might take umbrage at a dragon, you might start with these undeads and whomever might be controlling them. He makes a fair point. Let's poke around that spooky cavern for clues. Finally, Refio makes an appearance again after being cut out of the Alpha Beta for Legion, where he actually played a part in High Mountain, and he explained that he and Kairos, they had Garrosh form the Iron Horde to actually help us fight against the Legion, only to see it backfire. Inside the cavern, we do indeed find the undead shambling around, there are some smoldering constructs, some skeletons and geists, but in the back of the cave, that's where we find Charbone Goliath. This one is more than ready to try and kill the dragon. He has earth spikes coming out from the ground, a molten crash which has boulders crashing down and rolling around, and everyone's favorite attack, Calcified X, or more commonly known as Bone Storm. On his body, we find a demonic core stone. Deep within it, the image of a dreadlord speaks ominously. Yes, master. It shall be done at the exact time when you specified. The bronze dragon will see nothing. One shot from outside the obsidian dragon shrine is all I require. A dreadlord? And a bronze dragon? Wait. Is he talking about me? And it sounds like he gave away his position. Ha! Huh. Let's go to the entrance of the Obsidian Dragon Shrine and snuff him out. At the entrance, Chromie reveals the Dreadlord Zorophytes, who wants to put a stop to her time walking by using Carrion Swarm, which really, really hurts, an Infernal Strike, which summons an Inferno from above and stuns us, and he calls Cripple. But thankfully, he is stunnable, and on his body, we find another Chrono Shard. Huh. I wonder what the Legion wants with little old me. A chrono shard! Let's bring this back to Wormrest. I wonder when and where it goes. This one is fell touched, scarred with deep rivets of green malevolent energy. Being held by a dreadlord will do that to you, and at Wormrest, Chromie uses it to make another time portal. Wow, an oldie but a goodie. This portal points to the Well of Eternity. The Well of Eternity, just prior to the War of the Ancients. About 10,000 years before your time, give or take. Oh no! There I am! These foul wounds are bad. We need to get me back to Wormrest. Now there should be a time portal up on the other side of the well. <gasps> I know the way! <laughs> Follow me! Here we are at the Well of Eternity, where we've seen Chromie before, as during the Cataclysm, we travel back in time to pick up the Dragon Soul, to use it against the Deathwing of the present, and fulfill the aspects of their destiny. She sadly says the same thing in the cinematic, even when you play as a Night Elf who might have survived the War of the Ancients. But either way, our objective is to get this Chromie out of here by reaching the portal at the end. In our way stand the forces of the Legion. There are Abyssal Doombringers with a ton of health that slow you, Doomguard Annihilators, which die rather quickly but still cause 
Crippo, keen Fellstalkers that constantly spawn and track you down, and the greater Felguards who like to charge and slow you. We can't use the portal while in combat, so we have to go through this as quickly as possible by staying close to the well side, killing anything that stands in our way, until we're able to teleport up into Azara's palace, and there we can ignore the Dreadlord defenders with the corrupted Arcanist, while making our way down, killing any of the highborn troops that dare to stand in our path. Note how there are no packs of green fiery orbs this time, but that is because in this moment it's just before the War of the Ancients, just before all of that breaks out, so before the Night Elves formed the resistance and before Illidan even made his way into the palace. A random tidbit is that the door on the left, that is now open, but we can't enter it and we can only see the lights inside. The Corrupted Arcanist is immune to crowd control, but he can be moved away a little bit with line of sight, and the spot where he was hanging out, that oddly has a book called the Arcanist Cookbook. This book used to be obtainable in Dire Mall for a maid specific quest, which they simply had you return it to Lord Keeper Kildruff, and then he gave you the trinket called the Royal Seal of Eldre Falas. So this is apparently where it came from. Now after making our way into the courtyard, the last enemy standing is Grolafux. He casts Felglare and summons images of doom, which don't seem to do much, but it is a very nice hint at things to come, the Legion marching through these portals. Now the quick way to save Chromie in this timeline is to loot Tyrande's Moonstone from a time lost keepsake box which will summon an ancient moon feather hippogriff which will allow you to quickly travel to the palace entrance. I sadly haven't seen this item drop yet so I can't show you but either way we take down the demon to safely get Chromie out of here by taking her to the portal. There's the portal, let's move! Whew, I should be safe now. Here we go! Again! So those are 8 deaths that we need to prevent, and needs to be done within a 15 minute window, which might look like an impossible task, but it's actually doable. The Chromie talents help out of course, but through the run you'll also find sands of time, which can drop from chests, random trash, quests or the rare spawns. There are 5 of these rare spawns in total, we have Ice Shatter, Blood Feast, Ice Fist, Dragmar Runebrand and Bone Sunder, all of them Magnetar, and all of them were hunted down before, but apparently in this timeline they actually survived that encounter. The Sands of Time, they will give you two random options which offer different things. You could offer the Sands of Time to the Bronze Dragon Flight, this will earn you a buff to damage and healing, damage taken, movement speed, or you could even get the assistance of a bronze drake to instantly clear a shrine so you don't have to fight one of the bosses. The bronze dragonflights, they also offer a powerful temporary item in a time loss keepsake box, which has those items that I talked about before, the ones that will reduce the time needed for the different timelines. You could also choose to offer the sense to Chromie directly, which increases your reputation with her, or will give you a buff which increases the rate at which you gain the reputation. You could also sift through the sands of time to uncover valuable currency, like time warp badges or a time loss wallet. This wallet comes with gold, but sometimes also with an eightless bronze drake pet or a bronze proto well pet. Now you could also keep the sands for yourself, earning a bit extra time before Chromie's demise, borrow time as they call it. So these sands of time, they are very important and a bit of luck goes a long way. Now a big big thank you to Yakarsha for sharing his notes with me and helping out with optimizing the routes. Let's go! My run when I cleared it, it started off with picking up the quest from Kalik and heading out to the rare near the Emerald Dragon Shrine. I got a time loss keepsake, the one that instantly clears Ender Hall for you, and then I took care of Taylor's Vile Thorn at the Emerald Shrine. Then it was onwards to the Void Gargantuan at the Azure Dragon Shrine, Bloodfeast the Rare near this shrine and Bone Sunder near Wormless Temple. This got me a drake to instantly clear the Obsidian Dragon Shrine. Dragmar Runebrand is the rare near Ruby Dragon Shrine, which of course I took with me, and then followed by taking out Talar Ice Chew. Would you look at the time? Only about 10 minutes left. That's the four shrines done, the four attacks right here prevent it. Now we need to go to these four alternate timelines, and since I had the insta clear for Ender Hall, that's where I started to see what the sense of time might give me, followed by Mount Hyjal. Here I picked up another time loss keepsake. This time I got the Strathholm gate key, which skipped a whole bunch of that timeline, and I was able to instantly go for Nezar Azret. There's five minutes left. You think we'll finish in time? Only one more Chromie to save, the one within the Well of Eternity, and there wasn't anything special that I could do here. Just had to go through the gauntlet, try to avoid as many of the trash as I could, teleport to the palace, clear the waves in front of me, and then I was simply taking out Grolafux and get to the portal at the end. There's the portal. Let's move. <laughs> 
And that's it. We saved all the chromies. The timelines are exactly as they're supposed to be again. With her being alive and as a reward, we get the Time Warden's Plate Transmog or the male leather or cloth equivalent. If you keep on doing this scenario and increase your reputation with chromie to the maximum level of Time Lord, then you'll get the achievements called Chromie Homie and the title of Time Lord. I was a bit disappointed that there was no celebration voiceover. The ending felt a little bit abrupt. However, we went into this adventure with three goals in mind. We were going to try and figure out the why, the how and the who. Now the how, that's pretty clear. We have different sources that all wanted this bronze dragon dead. In the future, there was the Emerald Nightmare with the Seder, the Void with the Void Lord, the Undead with the Lich and the Dreadlord with his shambling corpses. They pulled the powers together in one single strike at the exact same time while in four different moments in time, four moments in which we partied with Chromie, another group was trying to take her out. The Alliance and Horde at Anderhal, the Legion at the War of the Ancients, the Norubians at the Culling of Strathholm, and the Minions of the Firelands within Mount Hyjal. This is a coordinated attack, all aimed at our favorite bronze dragon. That's the how, but why and by who? Well, the biggest clue that we have, that comes from the scribbled ravings, a scroll which I got from a time lost keepsake box. The handwriting on the scroll is jagged and frantic, yet it's strangely familiar. It says, Kill the dragon! Kill the dragon! Kill the dragon! It's not a gnome, it's a dragon! Not even a good dragon! Slay the dragon! Crossed the timeways one too many times, didn't you? Made a few enemies! Maybe caused a paradox you couldn't reconcile! The demons, the elementals, the humans and orcs! They're all on my side, not yours! Now you've gone and done it, whelp! So that seems to explain the why. Whoever wrote this note wants our chromie dead for whatever reason, but that doesn't answer the who. We have the Void, whose master has spoken and they obey. The Void Lord said, Strange, what are you doing here? Was it simply surprised that Chromie was not at Wormrest Temple? Or was it surprised to see its master? As in, were we the ones who gave this command, or perhaps even Chromie of the future who gave this command? The Lich also followed the commands of a master, so did the Dreadlord informed about the exact moment to attack. Considering how well this attack is orchestrated, not to mention that they've been able to mess with her time traveling, Chromie expects them to have a bronze dragon on their side, or perhaps even an infinite dragon. But still, who would it be? During the stream, we actually discussed this as well, and a couple of people suggested Refion, but I personally don't think so. He is shady with his answer as to what he's doing here, but Refion's always shady, and at every shrine, we have a dragon to represent their faction, and considering that the Black Dragonflight, it just doesn't have that many members left, I think that they picked Refion because he's the most well-known survivor. Then, as I was working on the script, I fought back to the first quest given by Kedgar. He would help her out himself, but his paralyzing fear of paradoxes, it prevents him from any any type of time travel. The note mentions, maybe caused a paradox you couldn't reconcile, but then I wondered why give us the quest to help Chromie if he wants her dead, which on its own is a paradox in itself. The use of whelp in the notes that had Garrosh's voice ringing from my mind, but then again, in her flight form she is a whelp. Kairos Dormudan perhaps, mistakenly pissed off at her putting him down during Draenor. I honestly don't know. I'll pass the question on to you guys and girls. Who do you think has it out for our Chromie, and most importantly, why? Is it the player itself? Will we find out in a future scenario that it was us from the future all along? Or perhaps it was Garrosh, or Ketgar, or Kairos, or Raphion, who knows? All speculation aside, I did really really enjoy this scenario. I love them back to Mr. Pandaria, and I hope to see a lot more of these smaller storylines told in such a way. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you all enjoyed this rather lengthy video. Don't forget to leave your speculation in the comments down below. Have a great week, and until next time guys, see ya!